Okay, so that was the general linear group. Now let's talk about a slightly more interesting type of group. And this is known as the orthogonal groups. So I'll begin with probably the, well, the simplest example of an orthogonal group, which is going to be called SO2, or actually no, O2. I'll introduce the S in a second. So the O obviously stands for orthogonal, and 2, we'll see, uh, is corresponding to a kind of dimension, but not really the dimension of the group, as we'll see shortly. So orthogonal groups, of course, are a subset of the general linear group of 2 by 2 matrices. So as we saw, the general linear group is the set of matrices, their invertible matrices. And now we impose some additional structure so I'm going to call my group elements R. And now we formed the orthogonal group by essentially saying, OK, take the subset of GL, and you have to also impose the condition that these matrices are orthogonal, which means that if you take the transpose and then multiply by the group element, you get the identity. So any matrix that satisfies this is known as an orthogonal matrix. And essentially the set of all orthogonal, and remember they have to be invertible to be in GL, form a, a subgroup. And it's special enough that it gets its own name, it's called the orthogonal group. And now this is the orthogonal group 2, or essentially of 2 by 2 matrices, or it can be represented by 2 by 2 matrices. It's not really referring to the dimension, or I'll say more about that in a second. Okay, so without diving too far into the details of how we come up with this representation, I'm just going to tell you that the orthogonal group in two dimensions we can represent by the following matrices. So this theta, which I've introduced now, is a free parameter. And we'll see in a second what this parameter corresponds to. But for now, I just want you to note that there is only one free parameter. So we would class this group as being one dimensional. Essentially, it only has one degree of freedom, which is theta. And now what these matrices effectively represent are an orthogonal, hence the name, an orthogonal rotation in the two dimensional plane. So if we have the two dimensional plane, which is obviously R2, and we pick any point, for example, we can describe points by vectors from the origin. What this matrix is going to do, if, you, if we just call this point AB, when we act on this point or vector AB with this matrix, you've probably seen this already, it's just going to rotate that vector. And now it's essentially, it, it's, it's called an orthogonal rotation because the coordinate axes themselves remain orthogonal when they're rotated. So this is a a right angle here, and then if I rotate my axes in some way, they're going to remain orthogonal. I haven't drawn that very well, but hopefully it's clear. So, okay, this group, or this matrix, essentially, it acts on vectors to rotate them, and now this is why we kind of refer to this O2 as being the rotation group. So this condition we can work a little bit more with. If we now take the determinant of this expression, we find, and now just properties of matrices, the determinant of a product of matrices splits into the product of their determinants. So this is just going to be, they're being multiplied there. And now another property of matrices is that the determinant of a transposed matrix is just the same thing as the determinant, so we can just get rid of that. And now we see, well, we know that R transpose R it has to be equal to 1, so this essentially is the determinant of 1, or the identity, sorry, which is just going to be 1. And now here we see that this is effectively the determinant squared. And then from this we can see that the determinant of any orthogonal matrix has to be plus or minus 1. So the determinant has to be plus or minus 1. And now what we usually do is we say, OK, we want to restrict ourselves to only the matrices that have determinant plus 1, because having a determinant of minus 1 is 
a transformation which is effectively going to kind of flip or mirror our axes. We don't want that in most cases. We just want to be rotating. So we restrict ourselves to the determinant being plus one, and that is even more special, and we call it SO2 for special orthogonal. So the S just means we're restricting to the component that has determinant plus one, and this is kind of the subset of the group that contains the identity transformation. That's another way to define it. Okay, so that's kind of just a kind of matrix description of this group. I mentioned that we have this theta parameter. Now, obviously, this theta parameter you can see is going to correspond to the angle which we're going to rotate by. So if we have some vector and then we rotate it to another vector, we're rotating it through an angle theta. So now I just want to explore this in a bit more detail when we talk about the topology of this group. So, of course, we know that this is a Lie group. It should be able to be described as a manifold. How do we realize this SO2 group as a manifold? Well, we essentially only have one coordinate, which is the theta parameter. So this is going to be a one-dimensional manifold. And now the only possible one-dimensional manifolds are either going to be a circle or a line segment. But let's just kind of see how this arises now. So if I just draw some axes for reference, if we think about what this group is essentially doing, I've said it's rotating us in the plane, how might we represent this as a manifold? Well, I'm just going to draw it for you and then I'll talk, to, tell you why it makes sense. So I've just drawn here a circle and now every point on this circle is going to represent a particular element of this group. So I've drawn one of these points here, it corresponds to some angle theta. So because we only have one parameter, or one coordinate, all the points that lie on this circle represent all of the group elements that I have here. So this point theta, when I plug it into this matrix, it will give me some set of values, for example. And then that is going to represent one of these orthogonal rotations. And now some reasoning which you can kind of do with this picture to co convince yourself that this is going to be a group. What happens when we effectively compose two group, uh, two group elements? Well, if we have two different group elements, this one corresponds to the element theta, and then this one can be phi. When we compose these group elements, we're effectively just adding the angles together. So we get theta plus phi, that's probably going to take us to somewhere over here. And now you'll be able to convince yourself that you can rotate around and then go back. So there is going to be an inverse, and we can just do no rotation at all, which is going to correspond to the identity element of the group. So what, what I've essentially done here is I've realized this kind of abstract matrix representation of the group in a kind of more geometric way, essentially representing these group elements as points on a circle corresponding to some rotation angle or the theta parameter. And now we can realize that this theta parameter is going to be bounded. Essentially, we can only go between 0 and 2 pi. And moreover, the 2 pi element is the same as the 0 element. So of, of course, this has to be a circle. And now you could have realized this by just playing with these values. You would find that if you put in theta equals zero, you get the same matrix as theta equals two pi. That would already be kind of telling you that there's going to be some kind of cyclic structure going on. And now, because we're in kind of one dimension, it makes it really easy to realize that this theta parameter is going to be a circular parameter. So obviously this is a kind of quite abstract topological argument now, we're saying that the set of matrix, well, the set of matrices which represent this group is now topologically equivalent, so homeomorphic to, don't worry if that's terminology you don't know, it essentially just means they're equivalent as topological spaces. The set SO2 is equivalent to, at least topologically, the topological space S1, which is the circle. So this is an extremely important realisation and it cuts to the heart of 
the intersection between geometry and group theory, essentially, is that we can realize these kind of groups now, they're abstract, they're abstract groups, they're just sets of matrices. We can realize them as manifolds, and this is probably the simplest example of uh, a group being a manifold. Okay, so this is obviously the simplest example that I could think of in two dimensions. We could consider the group O1, but that's just going to trivially just be a single element. Effectively, it's just the number one, because it's a, technically it's a zero-dimensional group, so it's just a singleton set, so it's not even really worth talking about. So SO2 is probably the simplest group that we've seen here that we can represent it as a circle, or rather it's topo topologically equivalent to a circle. And now we're going to extend on this idea going up one dimension, we're going to see that the group SO3 we can kind of realise as being equivalent to a sphere. Okay, so I'll just summarise this then. We've uh, I've introduced you to the orthogonal group, which is the subset of GL matrices which have to be orthogonal, which is this condition here. And I kind of showed you that you can represent these matrices um, in this form where they have a single free parameter. And we've realized that this parameter essentially corresponds to a rotation angle. And now we've seen how then we can use this to realize that this set of rotation matrices is a, a set is topologically equivalent to the circle.